what is the cause of violence? This is a big question. And quite frankly, this is something that we don't talk about enough or often in self-defense industry. And I believe because we're just not sure, many instructors and teachers, coaches are not educated on this matter. In this interview, Rich Dimitri, the co-founder and chief architect of Study of Violence, talks about the root cause of violence and what we can do to break the chain of violence so that we can create a safer place. He travels around the world to teach the root cause of violence so that we can prevent violence happen to you, happen to your family member, community, and in the world. He's on fire. He's so educated. He is a fascinating guy and takes completely different approach to self-defense. So fasten your seatbelt. You're going to enjoy this interview and hit the cue. So the big question is this, why well-being conscious women just like us who want to live a healthy and happy life are constantly feeling vulnerable like, what if I get attacked? And so many people who teach self-defense are tough men or martial artists who don't seem to understand what women really go through every day. How can feel safer and be more confident in our personal safety? That is the question and this channel gives you the answer. My name is Kinko Hamilton and welcome to Rise Up Against Violence. Okay, ladies, I have a confession to make. So I have this fantastic guest. I've been looking forward to speak, interview him for a very long time. And you know what I did? I did not hit the record button. Uh, so he's been sharing his awesome story for the last eight minutes and I had to retake it. So. Uh, but anyhow, he's kind enough to accept my uh, apology and it's moving on. So he is a co-founder and chief architect of the study of violence. He's been uh, also a Senshido International founder and teaching self-defense over 30 years uh, all over the world, including US, Canada, Europe, and Mexico. And he is in Montreal, Canada, which is my favorite city. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Rich. Rich thank Dimitri. You. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for, again, thank you for doing what you're doing. It's, uh, I believe it's really important work shining light to a very important subject. Thank, thank you, you very much. That. I absolutely appreciate that uh, coming from you. So Rich, you have a website called Study of Violence. Yeah. And I absolutely love that because you put such incredible information for free. Yeah. I refer that your website to pretty much everybody that I uh, come you know, in contact with because I think that's a foundation of self-defense to understand violence, right? Right. And why I started study, uh, doing self-defense is, well, I actually started martial arts thinking that's self-defense. And after concussion, bone bruise, bone fracture, cuts and bruise and everything, I realized that, hey, I'm so beat up, I can't even protect myself and how would I protect my children? So I had to rethink uh, what self-defense is. And that's how I started doing Women's Self-Defense Summit and this Rise Up uh, Against Violence channel. So I understand you are also a wonderful master artist and have several uh, black belts and certification on your belt. But Rich, tell us how did you start uh, your self-defense journey? and what what about the study of violence? Why did you study violence? Well, okay. Um, as I began to er answer earlier, which led to about eight minutes, and I wasn't. <laughs> I'm going to cut this a little shorter because our interview is about thirty minutes long. So, long story short, um, I was quite young on a school bus, maybe about four, five, six years old. You know. Uh, uh, maybe not four, because I would be preschool. My mom would be driving. So around six or seven years old, I've got memory blocks actually due to trauma. So just let me state that right off the bat. Uh, literally chunks of my life gone. Um, so that said, I witnessed um, construction workers at the corner kind of an intersection where, around where I lived from the school bus when we were stopped at the red light getting into a fight. Um, two on one, they knocked the man down on the ground and another guy took a shovel and began hitting him in the head with it and so I was I just froze watching that and uh I, the bus left and as this was happening 
And I never said anything to anybody. And that really, really felt horrible inside when I watched that, like, to, you know? And that memory only came out recently due to therapy sessions and stuff I've been doing. I had, that's something I had blocked out. Um, and I've never even spoken about this really to anybody in my life before, except my wife, Pam. So witnessing that was very traumatic to me, I believe, and kind of set me off on a bit of a path. And later on in my earlier teens, I began being bullied. Uh, Bruce Lee era came out. I was born in 1969, um, 73, 74, Enter the Dragon hits theaters. My dad sneaks me in the trunk of his car to watch it. We come out. He finds out I'm being bullied in school. Next thing you know, I start in the martial arts. Fast forward X amount of years being a Bruce Lee fan. Um, and Jeet Kune Do, I was searching for functionality over art. Uh, uh, I wasn't really looking for the spirituality aspect at the time. I wasn't looking, for, I was looking for the fight, you know? I was angry, I was a young man. I had traumas, uh, 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 my, you know, I lost my brother at an early age. Uh, uh, I worked for a narcissist for two years who was very, very abusive. Um, so a lot of that's kind of took its toll on me. I became very introverted, but extroverted at the same time, but only in my work. Uh, uh, all that wanting to lead me to functionality, I started researching, much like you, a variety of different experts in the self-defense and martial arts world. And although I found a lot of good people teaching very good things, nobody was really teaching violence prevention. Everybody was teaching their perspective or ideology or anecdotal experiences or limited research or whatever it was, you know, and it's what, it's what people were doing. And so I found that nothing was really very complete. Like nobody was dealing with the elderly in any of these situations. Nobody was dealing with, you know, why, how did we get to this point, right? There are a lot of people who did start, who were working within the psychological realms and the pre-contact elements from Tony Blower to Jeff Thompson and Mark McYoung and Peyton Quinn, Sammy Franco, and we're going back to the, you know, 80s, 90s here, right? And so these guys kind of pioneered that, and uh, uh, I'm like second generation to them because I came in the 90s as well, but long after, they were already established by that means, and so... I drifted off of all of these people. Uh, uh, as my research grew, I realized that no, none of these people had what I was looking for. The answers to why, how to outbirth it, how to prevent it, and if necessary, of course, how to defend it in the most logical, scientific, functional way for any human being, whether they're blind or in a wheelchair or they have a cane or they're 77 and have arthritis or it's a mother of eight or a you know, a, a young 22 year old golden glove champion, it doesn't matter because you take away all of those titles. And at the end of the day, even gender, we're human. And being human from a scientific perspective, there's a load of information on violence, on, on understanding the behavioral aspect, the roots, all of it. But you're not gonna find it in the self-defense world unless mm -hmm. you're towards us right now because honestly we were the first who started speaking about it and now it's kind of kicking off like wildfire and i'm thrilled to see it is trauma being the core root and uh, and it's pam who brought this to the self-defense world not me we brought it together she brought it through the vehicle of me because i was established but this is her baby and that is what i've been looking for my whole life What's the core root? And it's odd because it was in front of my face the whole time. I was suffering through it myself. I have mental illnesses. I've got complex PTSD, depression. I've got uh, social anxiety. And these are symptoms of my complex PTSD, right? And so, and, and so I started understanding that and going right and started seeing therapists. And so I started to grow and go, wow. And then Pam comes in and goes, hey, I'm a trauma-sensitive certified yoga instructor. All right. Tell me a bit about that. Boom. Holy shit, Pam. You, you, you got the missing link here. What? You've got the missing link. This is, this is how we outbirth violence. By dealing with trauma. By dealing with mental illness prior to adulthood in children, toddler, whatever it is, up to teens. Because once a teen reaches adulthood, 
And if they commit a certain act of any kind from the, uh, 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 if you want, from, from a sociopathic perspective, there is no, until present day, there's no turning back from that. Mm -hmm. There's no reforming a sociopath, like a full-blown diagnosed antisocial behavioral sociopath or psychopath for that matter. These are not till present day reformable. Does it mean they never will be? No, we don't know yet. We don't have enough information yet, but up to now they're not. But prior to that, prior to committing the first act, prior to understanding, this is where you outbirth it. Not just from a, um, a perpetrator perspective, but from a victim's perspective as well. Take a 16, 17 year old girl into consideration who took one of our courses, high school, five hour course, four hours of talking, one hour of physical. In the four hours of talking, we basically covered study of violence and all of that information blang in there, right? And for 17, 16 year olds, we're in a high school. Um, covering the antisocial violence archives. A year later, this girl contacts us and tells us that she went and sought therapy because she figured out through our course that both of her parents suffered from narcissistic personality disorder. Now she loves her parents and she didn't understand why they were abusive because they were also very, very loving. And the abuse was not on purpose. It wasn't, it's like a father smacking his kid in the head going, ah, moron, as a joke. That's abusive. <laughs> Right, you get eight years of that from the age of four till the age of fifteen every other day by your dad, well, tap in the head every time you do something stupid or dumb or clumsy, and he's joking about it. That's still abusive. You sit in a car with an individual who's got road rage, and you have to live with that 12, 13, 15 years of your life, hearing it every time you're in the car because it happens to be a parent. Now they're not yelling at you; they're yelling at somebody else, but you're the one who's absorbing it that's that's abusive right so from understanding i mean i can go on and on from that understanding this 17 year old girl 16 year old girl went to seek therapy to learn how to deal with her parents so she doesn't grow up resenting them or continue being abused by them so she didn't learn a single kick elbow punch nothing but we prevented a shitload of violence there, potentially speaking, her in the future from potentially becoming a victim, seeking out maternal or paternal uh, 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 people in her life in terms of relationships, as this is how the story goes, right? There's a butterfly effect to the psychological principle and behavioral aspects of abuse, even when an individual is completely unaware of it, right? And yeah. so all that stuff right there, boom. And we salvaged her relationship between her and her parents because she now understands as, as, as opposed to beginning to hate and resent them, she understands them and she's learning how to deal with them through therapy, as well as learning how to heal through the process of having to live with two narcissistic parents for 16 or 17 years. That's and that's how, you, that's how you outbirth violence. This is where you stop. This is where I'm so focused on these days. This is what we're really diving so deep into it because the rest is covered. We've got it covered. No, you're not going to reinvent a fucking palm strike, an arm bar, a flinch, a knee, a, a, a helmet, a fucking, you know, these are gimmicks at the end of the day. At the end of the day, can every human being do it? No matter their age, race, social, economical background, physical limitation, unless they're a vegetable at the hospital, of course, and, you know, reason withstanding. Right? Can anyone, you know, do it regardless of age or gender or anything like that? If they can't, and you have to be a certain something in order to be able to perform whatever it is an individual is teaching, it can no longer be labeled as pure and applied self-defense or violence prevention. At that point, you're falling under the R, the, the realms of combatives, fighting, art, sport, perhaps, right? If my mom can't do it, it's not self-defense. Now, my mom can't do 99% of what's being taught out there, even on a psychological level, because a lot of it is teaching people how to become hard targets. How is a 77-year-old woman going to become a hard target? That's she right. needs to learn how to become a negligible target, <laughs> right? She needs how to become an unseen target, an undesirable target, not a hard target. What does she can do? Get tattoos and shave her head? 
wear camel pants and walk the streets at 77. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, yeah, that's that's the core root, the outbirthing of violence. And there's a lot of people, like, I mean, we get people who will come to us and a lot of women in particular who want to learn. And through a very simple interview process, we find out that they're at a level that if they don't, if they don't legitimately get professional therapy, nothing, no matter how good the information is, it's going to reach her in the class format, much like you were saying earlier. It's going to work on the pads with the padded suit guy, in the, you know, with the coach going, yeah, yeah, name the boss, name the. It's going to work. But once, like you said, you displace it and you put that woman back in front of her abusive husband that she's been victimized to for the last three and a half years, that's a different, it's over. It's a whole other realm that okay. I, nor Pam, nor anybody in our industry, unless they are certified licensed therapists as well as self-defense instructors, can help her. Mm -hmm. Now, what we can do is accompany the therapy but we can't solely teach you. There's not, right. as a matter of fact, if we do, we might, we might at the end of the day hurt you. So, so Rich, you, what you're saying is trauma, trauma, um, I would say like the trauma healing, healing trauma, trauma care is the ultimate self-defense. 100% to start off with. That, that is the core roots, that's where it begins. And the understanding of it, because so many people abuse their children without knowing they're abusing their children, without meaning to abuse their children. Give us examples, but, Rich. Um, like I said, road rage incidences. Uh, do you live with any type of family member that you have to tiptoe around uh, 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 at certain times of the day or whatever? Like, do you have to always make sure the lights are shut every time you leave your bedroom or whatever room you're in, or you're going to get yelled at? Oh, I bring the electricity in this house. Oh. You, you know, is that the response? Uh, 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 be careful. So and so, you know, the weather outside is bad, and you know how they hate it when the weather is bad. So we have to be, you know, they're in that mood. You, you can't. That's that's it. Like now, they're not taking it out on you purposefully. My father, I grew up with him punching walls when he got angry at things, road rage. I'm, I'm not blaming him. He was a 22 year old dad, 23 year old dad, right? Who came from another country, who him too had was filled with trauma by that age from both of his parents and the culture and the world of a mess. And how he raised me is, and both my parents is miraculous. <laughs> because back then they didn't even understand any of this stuff. Hell, 20 years ago, we didn't understand any of this stuff. So uh, you, uh, all these types of things mark an individual from the father smacking a kid in the head in a joking fashion, calling him a moron from uh, uh, a road rage incidences if you're the one taking it in the car from uh, you know a, a, a family member calling you certain names because of the way you dressed or making you feel smaller even in a joking fashion now once or twice it's like in school once or twice you know it's like well I bought myself a pair of white jeans I think I was like 17 18 years old uh, I never wore them once in my life. I showed them to my cousin. He died laughing on the floor for literally an hour and 15 minutes, I think, wasn't breathing. And then I looked at him, I, I put them away. I never put them on. <laughs> you know? But he didn't consistently make fun of the way I dressed on a regular basis. That was a one-time deal. If it was consistent, it, you know, that's abusive. Eventually, you start to wonder, if I have to sit there and wonder what I should wear before I leave the house because one particular individual makes me feel a certain way, well, that particular individual is, is abusing me. And if it's consistent over a period of because you're stuck living with that individual, be it a sibling, a parent, a relative, a roommate, for X amount of years, that takes its toll. And people don't realize it. They don't realize the heaviness. And they bring that heaviness to other aspects of their life. So I'm going to bring all of that into my car. Somebody cuts me off, fuck you. That's this place to anger. I'm not really angry at him. I've done that a million times myself. How can I give somebody shit for the things I've done? It's, it's illogical because you're, you, there's nothing no one has done in a car that unless it's really out of this world, like, you know, jump a, a <laughs> Dukes a Hazard something, but, you know, cut off or a blind spot. Or, oh, I made a mistake or I'm driving a bit too slow in a lane. We've all done it. So if I'm yelling and I'm cursing somebody out for doing that who can't hear me, but the people in the car can, 
Who's really in receipt of all this rage and venom? My wife and kid. So, and, and they're going through this every car ride with me from the day my kid is born until he leaves the house at the age of 18, 19, 16, 21, whatever the hell it is. So it's like 18 years of that. Now that kid goes to school, some bully figure gets in his face. It resembles the same feelings get triggered from the ones he felt when his father was yelling. He succumbs to the bully. He doesn't know how to answer back. They bring that to work later on in life. Failed relationship, the fade relationship. You can't hold a job. You're spanking your kid. You're yelling at people. You're judging the guy down the street because he's dressed a certain way. That's, 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 you know, and if you're that type of person spewing that now, right, I'm, I'm, kind of like amalgamating a bunch of stuff into one character here, right? And there are people heavily toxic, but I don't know, you know, to the levels I'm explaining here, but understand it could be a variety of those things. And all of those things, if you're dealing with it on a daily, regular basis for years at a time, eats away at an individual's, right? Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> that's where you get chilled. That's where vic this is usually how victims become made because once the abuse gets a bit more elevated, there's now potential for, you know, much higher level defense mechanisms that are very ego-based, controlling, narcissistic, selfish, uh, uh, with limited and selected selective empathy. So you can borderline to sociopathy at this point, and you could border, you know, and at this point, there's a variety of different types. But what we do is we generalize them to give people a general understanding of what one may be potentially dealing with. So yeah, if sorry to interrupt, but it's not something that we see a lot these days, especially social media. Uh, like people do things that they don't do, they probably wouldn't do in front of somebody, but they would do that on online with no problem, right? Oh, yeah, that's yeah. There's 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 a lot of that, and there's and we're also living in a very very difficult time. This is very like we're there's a worldwide trauma going on right now, right? Look at the amount of conspiracy theorists that are coming out of the woodwork. That's a clear sign of trauma. Conspiracy theorism is a, is a uh, a, a symptom of of trauma. Mm -hmm. I have no control. I don't know what's going on. I need to control. I need to know. Oh, it's got to be this. It's got to be that. And now, now I have something to fight back. Now the warrior in me has a fight. <laughs> yeah, I. Yeah, some people need that. They need to fight. They need to have a constant fight in their lives. Mm. So there's a variety of manifestations to these things. They're not. They're not all necessarily rooted in what most would refer to as evil, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Even down to sociopathy, and that's yeah. that's an important term, I believe, that needs to be wiped out from the self-defense, violence prevention world. Evil monsters, this, that. It, it's it's to differentiate ourselves from these individuals. One does us no favor. Two sets us farther apart from being able to defeat monsters and evil beings for who really does that in mythicism and comics and religion and, 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 and action movies. It's always the hero that surpasses the average person, isn't it? And isn't that what most people portray when they teach self-defense? I am the man. I am the guru. I am the boss. I am the instructor. Bow, hail to me. <laughs> <laughs> My this, my that. It becomes, hey, look, our, like it or not, our industry attracts traumatized people. Who, oh, who, yeah. I mean, it, no. you know, I mean, totally get it. I'm, I'm, I live through trauma. I'm traumatized. Yes, I think did. that's why, that's why I was just so uh, into, not into, but I'm just committed to find the way to make people safer, including myself, you know? Right. right. And so th that's, that's huge. So if you look at our industry, every one of us, the experts, came into this. Well, 99% of us came into it because we were traumatized. And we needed to feel something that made us feel stronger. Mm -hmm. And we had a sense that, hey, I want to share that with others. Some of us had that sense. And a lot of us had the sense of, wow. Look at how people treat me now that I'm a black belt or I've been doing this. Oh, you're yeah. a tough guy. Eh? We got to work know. out with you, eh? Your hands are. And so that's very ego pumping. Oh, I think I'm going to teach now. 
Why? They're going to put me on a pedestal, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And they do. I've been put on pedestals by tons of people. And I always knock myself down for them right off the bat. I've got nothing to do with anything. Get off me, man. I'm just information. You know who you should be hanging off of? You go your mechanic who fixes your brakes. He saves your life every single day. I'm just giving you information. What you do with it at the end of the day is up to you. I'm, I'm not going to be there. So I, I don't take credit for people who successfully defended themselves in terms of, ha, look at what I did for him. No, look at what he did or she did with the information. That's what happened. Because I'm also not going to take responsibility for a potential failure. As I tell people, there are no guarantees. Hey, I ain't a salesman. I'm not selling you anything. I'm, I'm here to help you uh, as much as I can. And at the same time, I got to make a living off of it. But as much as I can, I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, right on. I, yeah, I appreciate that and I admire that. I um, think that's a, uh, you know, things definitely missing from the industry. And, uh, you know, people talk about experience. You know, I, I've, I've done this for, you know, 30 years, 40 years, or we two combined together, we have 60 years of experience, 80 years of experience and stuff like that, right? But like, hey, if you're really not solving the problem, it doesn't matter how long you're doing it. Um, so that's my- <laughs> It doesn't, and it's because look, there's so much out there being taught. Right. It's the same thing. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. It's repeti- how, many, how many different variations of a hammer fist? Are you gonna be? De- are you gonna teach? I mean, let's be honest. How many different knees or right. elbow strikes, or you know? And then people get really gimmicky with stuff. Oh, we got to teach the elderly. The elderly walk with canes. We're gonna create cane fu. Oh, I never heard of that. You never heard of cane fu? Mm-hmm. It's people who teach the elderly how to use their canes. Motherfucker, why do you think they have a cane? Yeah, they can't. Yeah, they need. They need it to stand. Yeah. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> you know, you know, there's so many gimmicks that, and people are, they love gimmicks. Like, I don't, there's no name to what I teach. I study, it's violence, prevention. Mm-hmm. What's this? There's no system. You can't, you can't systemize this. Mm-hmm. We're still figuring shit out. There's no system. Yeah. There's concepts. We've got principles. We've got scientific principle you know on behavioral but there's no black and white here I, there's no i can't go out and tell you well when somebody does that you do this right so what's your what's the principle that you teach in terms of like what to do when to do how to do things you know that is like um that is a workshop and a half on its own that can't really be answered like that um <laughs> i get it about, i get you right it's a it's about understanding human behavior in relation to violence based on your immediate environment and potential immediate threats that surround you in your life. Right. And that is the strongest aspect. It's, it's not at the end of the day, there's no moves. There's no secret this, or uh, like a lot of people, do you teach that? Or do you teach this? I'm like, I don't know. No, not, not like that. No, because the people won't remember that. Like right. the mount, the dismount, buck to the left, buck to the right. Use your left muscles. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like it's it's not it's not happening. You get a 280 right. pound man who's jacked on side. It's like Pam explained, I think, with you in the last one, one of our her students, her uncle was trying to kill her after he murdered her aunt and beat her to death with a hammer. And he's mounted on top of her, but between a bed and a wall. So you know, buck it, it's just not happening. The guy might weighs you by 90 pounds. He's a grown ass man. He's a mixed martial artist. Who knows what he snarted 20 minutes ago before he decided to snap and right. And so people aren't taking that into consideration when they're teaching block this, block that, do that, or, or move this way. Or when somebody grabs you, you're going to, it's like, you, you have no idea what you're talking about in terms of the grab. It's not about the grab or how I'm going to move. Mm-hmm. It's about how I'm going to get through the energy that's coming at me. Because at the end of the day, it's not the move that counts or the specifics of the attack. It's the energy that's behind that attack. And what is that? It's emotional energy that is anger, rage, hate, racism, jealousy, fear. These are powerful emotions. Right. Now, jack that person up with all these powerful emotions 
let's imagine he snorted three lines of Coke down two Oxycontins with half an ounce of vodka 45 minutes before snapping chemical cocktail in his brain and depression hit and he turned around and grabbed me by the throat. I'm going to pluck a knee. I'm going to, I'm going to helmet or do this. It's the, you know, it, fuck no, nobody It's like, it's not about all these things. It's about understanding that. Right. I'm going, oh shit, here I am. Right. How am I going to get through this mm-hmm. and get back there? It's like her <laughs> student, one hour of physical. How are you going to get between here and there? You want to see your mom and dad again? Yeah. That guy's in the way. Right. At the end of the day, he's, he's between you and your mom and dad. Right. You want to hug your mom? You got to get through him. Right. And if you don't, you don't know if you might go after your mom and dad next. Right. So what are you going to, right? And that's a very, very, look, you go back to the, to send, there are books written about this in terms of survivability. You go back to the Holocaust and the, the survivors of the camps, the, the, one of the main reasons this, they survived compared to the, those who weren't shot, of course, or put in the ovens and all that stuff, but the ones who actually made it through, who, worked, who had to work through and they weren't put to death, the ones who survived was because they had something to live for, someone to live for. My son is out there somewhere. I want to see them again. The ones who had things to live for, like, oh, maybe by Christmas, the war will be over. Literally, 2 to 5% of them would die weeks after Christmas when the war wasn't over. It's like they gave up. Oh, maybe by the summertime, the war will be over. Another 2 to 5% would die around summertime when the war wasn't over afterwards, when fall would hit. And this went on and on. The ones who survived at the end when they were interviewed were, like I said, all the ones who had someone or somebody out there that I need to get back to, my wife, my kid, my, my husband, my dog, my, right? And so that is the mindset of a survivor. And at that particular moment, when that shift is made, they're not, there's no way in hell any human being, unless they're a seasoned veteran of some sort, they've been a bouncer for 18 years, an ex-cop, somebody who has had to deal with violence on a regular basis and navigate through it because that was their career. But the average human being, in that particular moment when that switch is made and goes, I got to get through this person because I want to have my parents again, like, like Emily did, she doesn't remember what she did. Right. They, you're, she was beaten in the head 12 times, went in and out of consciousness. When she woke up, she thought she was dreaming. How the fuck is she going to remember? Let's stop. <laughs> right? Wait, there's 22 points to the helmet. I need to, what? Number 13. <laughs> what? Bang, bang. You, like, you're not thinking. It's not, you're not thinking. You're flailing. You're going in and out, of, right? And so all of a sudden, she doesn't know what she did. All she remembers, you want to get home? Yeah. What debilitates a human being? No matter what drugs they're on, no matter how angry, pissed, uh, uh, chemically induced, mentally ill they might be, what debilitates a human being outside from a bullet in the head, like with your bare hands? Well, both eyes. Why? I don't care how strong, how tough, if I plunge my fingers in both of your eyes, you, you can't see anymore. It might not hurt. You might not feel it. You might go Tasmanian devil and even punch me, and I'm going to get knocked to the ground, whatever. But now you can't see me. Marco Polo, motherfucker. Where am I? You, you know, go nuts. So I'm, that's debilitating. Then you've got the windpipe and the arteries. If you know how to choke somebody and you can get to that guy, Beautiful, all the more power to you. My 75, 77 year old mom, you can t- t- teach her the rear naked joke for the rest of her life. She's never gonna make it happen against a guy whose neck is this thick, so forget it. She's out, so is my kid who's nine, he's out. If an adult tries and he tries the rear naked choke, my friend Ian, who's a vampiro wrestler from back in the days and still fucking involved in the business, I don't care how good he is at choking people out, he's not choking Ian out, why? He's not wrapping around, he's not big enough. Ian's neck is this big. So it's, the, it's just physics. Right. So that moves out. But the windpipe, 
My kid could slam into it. Yeah. Crack it. So can my mom. Right. Once enough, please. I don't, and grab. She could do it. Mm -hmm. So can somebody with mild arthritis with one hand. Uh, 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 with a, you know, it's doable. Windpipe, both of the eyes. Right. What else is debilitating on a human being? This, this really about it. The balls is no guarantee. Breaking yeah. a person's leg is no guarantee. Hell, man, shooting a person is no guarantee, even stabbing them. Why? I used to work with a guy way back in the days. He was a doorman. In a situation, violent fight, guy pulled out a knife, stabbed him 13 times. Gut area. Pop, 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 pop. The doorman. Stabbed the doorman. The doorman defends himself, strips the guy his knife away, right? Fucking hammers him down, drives himself to the hospital. 13 stab wounds. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. And he survived. Wow. Oh, so thank God. Didn't bleed out. Yeah. No major, no major organs were hit. The ones that were didn't penetrate too much. He made it. He survived. Wow. So tons of people survived getting stabbed. Mm -hmm. Depends where. Depends right. on the depth of the cotton, right? But I don't care who you are. If I shove both my, all my fingers through both of your eyeballs, every human being is going to have the exact same reaction. I can't fucking see anymore. Right. Love I it. don't care who you are, what right. gender, nationality, race, rage, drug. So we need to, violence prevention at the end of the day has to bank on these types of things mm -hmm. that are scientifically, first of all, proven, mm -hmm. fact, right? Mm -hmm. and that every human being on earth can access. Right. No matter the, right? Because if it isn't, then it cannot be, in my opinion, morally anyway, taught as efficient self-defense. Unless you're labeling it like, I teach self-defense specifically for doormen. Okay, that's great. I'll teach all the elbows and headbutts you want. It doesn't matter. They're going to be able to do it. Why? Well, they apply for the job. They have to be probably big guys or fight. They, that, it applies. It's self-defense for door men. And even then, there's the law, morals, ethics, right? Learn to hit fucking hard. Punch the guy in the face, drop him. He bangs his head, dies. Mm -hmm. Not, oh, okay, he doesn't die. Vegetative state. Brain dead. Hospital. Or forget it. Okay, he falls, he bangs his head. Quadriplegic. Neck down, he's paralyzed for the rest of his life. Brain functions, though, you're lucky. And you're a doormat because the guy got in your face and you learned to hit really fucking hard. Is right. that self-defense? No. So if you're teaching doormen self-defense, it can't even be taught as self-defense. It should be taught as combatives. Combatives is not self-defense. It's combatives because the, the very term is aggressive, combative. I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a, right? I'm combative. I'm not... Self-defense, protective, I'm not defensive. I'm not trying to de-escalate or defuse. I'm provocative, I'm combative, I'm aggressive. Back off or else. Yeah, right. Not, hey man, how can I help you? It's very different. Right, so, it's really different, yeah. yeah it, but, but it has to be done as such, where I find that most people don't do that. Because right. for one, either they don't know, which we're trying to help and educate, and, and it's help, it's working. If you, like... You look at, like a lot of people now are teaching trauma-sensitive or trauma-informed self-defense. And Pam has taught many people, like instructor-level people in very high places on how to teach it. The only thing is we don't do certification because we mm -hmm. don't want that headache. Right. So, yeah. and, and we can't certify you in this. This isn't, this isn't mine to certify anybody with. Right. You see... It's a scientific process. It, 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 what we're doing, if anybody went out and wanted to teach violent prevention as a totality from like abuse, emotion, everything to the physical, everything, right? They would have to do what we're doing and right. study what we're studying and go right. to places and, you know, like criminology and uh, behavioral science and uh, 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 like you were talking about also, you know, cultural differences uh, uh, and understanding the racist, there's so many different aspects because certain gestures, like if you try to deescalate in Mexico City, it's not gonna, it's not working very well in a social violent situation. You're gonna be look like as a pussy, and they're gonna drop you just for deescalating. So, so it's not. There's different. It's a different. You could deescalate, but it's not in the same way you would in North America. Right. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. We could. yeah. 
It's if, I got a guy, if I'm in Mexico City and a guy gets in my face and I'm like, hey, man, I'm like, how can I help you? He's going to look at me and call me a flay. Hey, mighty go and look at this. He's going to like, fuck, stand up for yourself, bitch. I'm going to beat you down just for being a pussy, pretty much. At least back in the days when I was going in and out of Mexico City, you know, maybe hopefully things have changed. But, you know, but back then anyway, there's specific aspects and differences, of course, and many cultural applications of defense and understanding the behavioral sciences behind it. Absolutely, so we yeah. We don't own any of this. This is not ownable. Like this isn't, I don't, we don't have a name. There's no us, there's no system or method. The method is progressive because we're learning as we're going along continuously and into this vast field. I right. mean, as we stated on a physical level, the shredder alone, the five principles of physical retaliation, not not the ripping of the face, but just those five principles. Oh my gosh, we Rich, you have to talk about that real quick because the, you're the creator of sh shredding, right? No, no. See again, it's not. It's a. It's a miss. I didn't create it. It's. It, it, see, you look at the shredder is five principles of physical retaliation. I didn't create those. I I didn't create economy of motion. I didn't create non-telegraphic movement. I did not create closest weapon to closest target. I did not create uh, uh, tactile sensitivity or eyes and throat being debilitating. I didn't even come up with that. That's been known forever since humans right. were human. Like, so it's not my creation. Now, in terms of how I teach it, pooling the principles together and teaching it as a concept, yeah. That's a method, that's my way of teaching that information because of how I understood it. Right. I can't own that. So I can't, I can own the name The Shredder, but at the end of the day, it's not even really mine because one of my students coined it that way back in the mid nineties. Oh, he went wow. Back and, yeah, he was working on the Bob Dummy with one of my instructors and they're doing the five principles of physical retaliation because that's, it was known as just that. And so, but they're in close quarter and clinch. So he's working it from the clinch. Right. From the clinch, you're not swinging because if you understand the five principles, yeah, yeah. you're either going to be crushing the throat, slamming the elbow, gouging yeah. the eyes, head butting or spitting or, right? Very, yeah, yeah. On the, you're applying the five principles. Right. Now this, this kid, he's not understanding. He's having trouble. He's having trouble. And finally, he kind of clicks in. So he goes on, on the face. So Mark, the instructor goes, Warren, you got it. Excellent. That's it. That's great. He goes, oh, it's just like a shredder. So Mark goes, yeah, exactly like a shredder. Now shred the fucking thing. <laughs> so he, he, he got it. Now, I'm not hearing any of this, but this kid goes back to the Bronx, or I think he was in Brooklyn, New York, back in the mid-90s, and goes on, we had a Senchito forum that was really populated at the time, very right? lots of people from all over the world. And he goes on it, and he goes, Hey, I just learned the shredder at Senshido this weekend. It was excellent. The five prints, blah, 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 blah. And everybody started calling it that. Wow, that's great. And so it started being known as the shredder online. People started calling it, oh, I did the shredder. Oh, Rich, when are you going to release a shredder DVD? I'm like, it's, what is a shredder? Like, what, is, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so, and then one of my other students, my local students comes in with that now famous drawing of the face being ripped apart. It's his face as an artist that he put in two hands tearing it apart. And he wrote the shredder in like really 90s style, cool comic -y book font. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. We make t-shirts. Next thing you know, there you go, <laughs> the shredder. So yeah. and honestly, the name has been more of a curse because everybody thinks it's just about ripping somebody's face. Like it's not, I can apply the five principles of physical retaliation if I'm boxing, if I'm in a street fight, if I'm in a wheelchair, if I'm blind, if I'm close, there is no range or it's not just about the shredder. The aspect of ripping somebody apart at very close range is nothing more than the manifestation of the five principles of physical re retaliation at close range. Mm -hmm. Because if you do them at far range, they don't look anything like that. Right. Now, these principles have umbrella, like each principle had, goes into depth now. Of course, right? yeah. For example, closest weapon, closest target isn't just about that because you're going right. to find yourself in positions at times where you've got access to three or four closest weapon, closest target. Do the most damaging one. Is that what's required by law in this situation? Here I have access to shoving my thumb in his eyeball, but I can also throw a knee to his thigh. 
but this is a social violence situation at a bar against a drunk guy. Do I want to shove my thumb three quarters of an inch? No, probably not. So I learned how to choose my knee over my thumb, but that comes into the training of understanding it's not just about your closest weapon, closest target. It's about the most moral, legal, and ethical required one for that situation mm -hmm. at the time. Now that requires a lot more training than four or five hours, but in a very simple, short process, the five principles, because if you're dealing with somebody that you're teaching for only a few hours, you're never going to see them again, or they're never going to do anything again after, and they were forced to be at your class because you're teaching at some school or some community center, you have to impart them with the most useful information that they're going to be able to access like tonight if they need it. So at that point, you can't get into depth of each principle. You just have to go and explain them and then go, here's what you do. Here's what you're fighting for. Right. At the end of the day, the most important thing you got to ask yourself is, who do I want to hug when this is over? Right. And get there. So in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of information. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, you shared a lot with us. And uh, it's a very, very important part of self-defense, which nobody talks about. Uh, not enough being discussed or brought up. And I've also right now studying uh, trauma-informed self-defense. And it's, it's incredible that, you know, more you learn about it, more self-awareness you have, right? It, it increases. Right. Isn't it's that you. the best part? It forces you to look at yourself and go, wait a minute. Exactly. Oh like my that. God, yeah. yeah. Oh no, not just that. These people <laughs> around me are kind of a bit, holy shit, right? And so it's, it's brilliant because there's where the outbirth begins. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how much things are gonna be prevented just because people understand this? I mean, I am so glad you brought this up. I'm so glad you're talking about this because again, not enough people talk about this, especially in the self-defense industry because it's still 99% of the time, it's a physical, how to do this, how to do that, techniques and stuff. So that's why uh, I wanted, I wanted, I've been looking forward to speaking with you. Um, because I believe you're one of the few who talk about it and actually making a difference in the world. So, uh, with, absolutely. Uh, with that being said, uh, our interview time is getting closer to the end. So, Rich, I, I would like to ask you one last question. Two. So, you shared with us how to upbirth violence, right? So, yeah, roughly, very, very. Roughly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, we yeah. can go deep, deep, and of everything, we can always, uh, we are always evolving, and we can always learn, and we can always improve. But if somebody is in a domestic uh, relation, in interpersonal relationship, and they have, let's say, kids who are, those are the people who watch this channel, uh, what would you say to them? What would be, uh, what would you say to them in terms of, outbirthing violence Th that's um this is really really tough because it's very important to understand everybody has and i don't want to sound mystical or mythical here but we all have our path to walk no matter what some people are going to walk a certain path right what i mean by that is it's not possible from my understanding to help an individual who doesn't want to be helped they're like a ticking time bomb if you force them out of whatever it is you're trying to help them with meaning by that that there's going to be a relapse and it's usually a million times worse when they do whatever it is be it an abusive relationship be it an addiction to a, a substance be it right so the first thing is to see and understand, does that person want help? Then there are those who aren't aware. They're just, no, no, and they're, it's an, 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 like, I mean, the defense mechanism and the, the source of denial kicks in. And then it's very dependent on the nature of the situation as to why the person stays and the denial, why? Because Sometimes they're staying with their kids, even there they're being abused and their kids are witnessing it, but the individual is providing for the school, for food, for education, for, for the da, 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 that the person without this person feels that somehow in their mind, they can't provide to their kids. They'll the kids will never have all this. So I'm going to take these beatings for my kids, right? So 
all I can say is, is, is if you're at a point where you realize you need help and you want it, the first step is professional therapy and juxtaposed together, social services. Let them evaluate the situation as well for the child's benefit. Mm -hmm. But that is such another nightmare. To... <sighs> Social services isn't, it's, you know, uh, it's almost like throwing them from the, the, the frying pan into the boiling water. It's, but hey, it's, it's, it's all we've got and it's the best we've got. And that's, you got to kind of toss the dice because staying where they are certainly isn't, <laughs> right? That's a hell of a judgment call. I'm not in the position to be able to tell people what to do on this because I'm not living what they're living. Right. But all I can say is if they are ready and they want it and the possibility is there, then to, to get to professional therapy and social services, potentially even law enforcement, depending on the level of abuse and what it is. Right. Because there's so many... Yeah, that's a that's a hell of a question. So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your honesty and your feedback. Yeah. Uh, very much appreciate it. So for those who are watching and you know, want to learn more from Rich, you can go to studyofviolence.com and the information is below. So once again, Rich, thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank you. We're also all over social media. We have a Facebook account and you can find me pretty much anywhere and contact us. Yeah, um, I'll put all the information down below. Thank, Thank you, you so Rock. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. My pleasure. My Take care. Would you like to get the devices from the world's top self-defense experts? If so, go in and get your pass from www.womensselfdefensesummit.com.